This is Hammurabi. He gets the full technology after securing a Eureka, but this wasn't enough for him. You see, he wanted more and wanted to test the limits of his skills by flying planes in the Stone Age. This was the predicament facing the man who was chosen to lead the Babylonian people in one of the worst starting locations as his enemies were given every advantage, leaving him on the precipice of complete collapse. But before all that, we have to go all the way back to turn one where their first challenge was where to settle their small village in this dookie location. The Babylonians force marched for hundreds of years, making sure to keep the river in distance as that will be pivotal later on, discovering rare gems and establishing a merchant town to center their economy around. The people had no idea how to work this strange gem and to ensure the town's stability, they begun working on new mining techniques to extract the rare resource. But they still had to find buyers for their gems and thus sent out a scouting party who soon discovered that they they weren't alone. Down south, there was a poor, unorganized tribe they enslaved into their gems industrial complex, which would feed the trade between the two other city-states. With ties strengthening and potential alliances on the horizon, this honeymoon phase would soon shatter, as they would come to realize not everyone was friendly. In the east, a few nomadic spearmen launched a raid against our scouting party, but despite their expert discipline, the superior equipment of the spears obliterated the lightly armored vanguard. This military defeat sent shockwaves as the nearby camp could raid them at any time, so Hammurabi reached out to his allies for help, who directed him to George's leader Tamar, as well as the Mapuche's leader Latoro. While suspicious of Tamar's close proximity, he decided to work with her as she would deal with the desert nomads, while Babylon would deal with the southern road bandits. A warrior force was quickly dispatched, but this task would prove difficult as the bandits were far too entrenched. The Slinger Corps had to be called in an attempt to dislodge the speared in infantry, leaving the warriors to begin seizing property. This left the bandits unhappy at this turn of events, who launched an unexpected ambush. However, now defortified, they made like the Confederates, and were quickly bum-fiddled, leaving few alive as a message to any would-be raiders. This newfound security allowed the merchant class to fund larger mines, but with this increase in production, they needed a faster way to refine the metals. And so, specific industrial zones began popping up, inching closer to the factories needed to manufacture manufacture planes. However, they won't fund a dedicated industrial sector just yet as there is something they needed to complete first. But before they can enact their plans, a massive barbarian invasion appears from the Empire's northern borders. With such deep positioning, they can ruin the economy if left unanswered, and so funds were diverted to creating prototypes of the bow and arrow, while forces were recalled from down south to counter the threat. While this mobilization was ongoing, there was something else brewing a little to the south, where a second settlement was constructed. With Georgia themselves enroaching upon their territory, this would serve as a frontline city to defend the capital as well as power projection to prevent Georgian settlers from moving west. But most importantly, it would serve as a center of industrial development before even the capital. Why this course of action was chosen, we'll get to later, but for now, the forces have mobilized and it's time to push the barbarians back. The barbs had advanced to the city, pillaging everything on the way, but while they reached the gates of Babylon, the well-trained and disciplined army managed to repel their frontal assault and then surprise them with a counterattack. With their forces on the run, the camp was soon discovered to have been orchestrated right in their backyard. Let's just say there were no survivors. This act of barbarism paved the way for the classical era and with how much they've had to deal with in foreign invasions and awful lands, the nation of Babylon has done pretty well for itself. With this survival, people were sure their prosperity came from a divine deity. The city patron goddess, they called her, giving them the resilience to get new cities and industries up and running considerably faster. With this newfound age and vanquishing of the tribes, now Hammurabi could focus on his main goal of discovering flight. But Hamudaddy couldn't win with these cats and needed more land. So south is where they needed to go, but on the way they encountered an old friend. The descendants of the victims of genocide were none too happy with what we did to their ancestors and managed to stay under the radar until this very moment, launching themselves 
settling the city of Barupa, but aside from the land, it really was never supposed to be the last hope of Hammurabi. No one could have guessed how poorly that line of thinking would age. But as this afterthought of a city was selling farms for the cheap, the second city had finally completed its industrial center, and Babylon was none too far behind. The industrial sector in the second city first was crucial, as after building their first of any district, Babylon always includes a free building at no extra cost. And with the need of two workshops, the weaker city was given priority. But with new centers of industry progressing and the prototypes for how to fly being planned in Hamu Daddy's inner circle, a new threat was emerging from the southeast. After insulting the Babylonian leader, she moves in with her war chariot, which doesn't impress anybody. And instead of improving the military, Ah, well, you see, that would be expensive, and flight was so much cooler. And so, in his greed, Hammurabi neglected the threat and established a form of government more befitting peaceful times than the dangers they found themselves in. That would soon prove a fatal mistake. But the benefits of such a governing body as a republic was that it allowed better allocation of resources and faster construction. As somewhere in a musty basement in the city of Babylon, somebody discovered that steam was really cool. And while everyone was ecstatic at the benefits this advanced industrialization would bring, you could see the exact moment Hammurabi realized, we are fucked. You see, the entire plan was to set up a valley on the Not Rhine River, but with coal discovered, the industrialists would never allow such a rare and valuable resource to be ignored in favor of a vanity project. A catastrophe as Hammurabi had to quickly find an alternative source, but with no rivers, that only left the boondocks of Barupa. And so, despite common sense, Hammurabi needed those plains. Even at the expense of the Empire, whose resources were sent towards a massive industrial development scheme for the poor city. Funds that were taken from other government bodies, not least of which the military. And there was one person who could not only sense this weakness, but was also in a position to take advantage of it. The Georgian military crossed the border and ambushed the garrison, delaying the Babylonian response and allowing a clear lane for her siege equipment to move through to the city of Shapir. In response, the Babylonians sent their elite archers as well as a few levies in a desperate defense of the frontier. Upon hearing this violation of sovereignty, the Nan Mandolians mobilized their own forces and would soon serve a potent distraction in the south. With only having to face a portion of her forces, the job was far less daunting, but with the damage the catapults did to the city, the threat was nonetheless dangerous. But with their advanced archers, even testing some automatic bolt prototypes, Babylon's army was able to weather the storm. With a minor respite, advisors insisted on more troops, but Amurabi was and hearing it, and sent more resources for Barupa to rush the Ruhr Valley. In this development, one of the workers discovered a tribal village in the distance, and while he could have sent word back to the capital and gotten a scout dispatched, the builder was based and put his own life on the line instead of having that monstrosity dilute the Babylonian gene pool. While that was ongoing, the Georgians had regrouped after their disastrous first assault and launched another. But unlike before, the Babylonians were dug in and beat it back with ease. However, with her siege equipment, Shapir was devastated, and in an effort to gain more funds for his vanity project, Hammurabi pleaded for peace, but Georgia wanted an indemnity. And with the economy doing so poorly, Babylon decided paying this in exchange for peace would be the economically sensible option, hopefully reopening trade routes and preventing her from attacking again. And immediately after the peace was established, the deal paid dividends. By making more money than if they were in a state of war, the coal power plant was financed, which revealed a more practical energy source for giant planes, and also battleships, but that's not important. And after discovering such a valuable resource plentifully abound throughout their lands, all that was left was to build the Ruhr to serve as the industrial epicenter of production. While the economy was chugging along, the military was neglected, however with planes coming in soon thanks to the oil, Hammurabi wasn't all too worried, something he came to regret a few short turns later. Immediately after the truce expired, Georgia set about to rectify the humiliation her nation faced all those years ago. But the Babylonians weren't exactly worried since they had already won before, and in no way did they think the Georgians could break the Magina the city. But Georgia brought in different kinds of more advanced units, and this is when Hammurabi started sweating. While this assault was beaten back, the issue was the 
the fact that in this war, Tamar had an ally, which would prove devastating to the already struggling military of the Babylonians. But by sheer luck, the Apadana was established as a diplomatic center, and by inviting the Zanzibarian advisor to witness, the Great Petra, he was able to convince him to establish peace between our nations, allowing Babylon to fully focus on the Georgian threat. The Georgians, however, were not sitting by idling this entire time, and by the time Hamu Daddy's forces were in position, he was about to meet his grandfather. Despite focusing fire on the unique units of Georgia, downing hundreds in the process, the difference in military strength was far too great. Their last hope rested upon this warrior exerting a zone of control against this unique swordsman. Unfortunately, he didn't even register as a threat, and the flanks were ignored in order to take out the frontline city and its garrison. With the city gone, Babylon was in disarray as the fortress that held for hundreds of years was now lost, and the Georgians weren't done yet. With his forces now woefully out of position, their survival was prioritized and regrouping was established, including the mass production of crossbow bolts that had been experimented on earlier. But in this calm before the storm, Hammurabi took this opportunity to send envoys to the World Congress seeking aid in this dire time. However, earlier, Hammurabi traded away most of his envoys for gold shipments that were cut off almost immediately. And by the slimmest of margins, an emphatic no was reached in the emergency proposal. The only hope Babylon had was the Ruhr Valley and biplanes, and with two of the greatest minds on the job, it wouldn't be too long before it would come online. But even the greatest minds needed time to cook, and right now the oven was still preheating. So could they stall long enough for the terror from the skies to make their appearance? And all of a sudden, she launched a second surprise attack obliterating the warriors in one battle, and with the front line now broken, forces disorganized. They were getting decimated, and it was about to get a whole lot worse. A knight charges through and takes the city's defenders by surprise. The ones who survived that initial shock retreated due to the sheer awe and presence of the knight. And despite their naval landing shortly thereafter failing, the capital was completely unprepared for a siege. Hammurabi needed to act fast or get slaughtered. However, his line of thinking was simple. Just a few more turns and all of this could turn around. And so the hills outside the city were fortified with whatever forces they could muster as they began bracing for an attack. An attack? That never came. You see, the Georgians already thought they'd won and begun celebrating their victory a little too early. Boom! With this new city on the lake fitted with shells that would prove too big for even an adult film star to fit in her chocolate starfish, hellfire rained down upon Georgia. But as the siege was being laid to the lost city, they repaired their defenses. And while Hammurabi could have kept up the pressure, the battleship needed coal to keep working. Coal that dried up when the Petra city was lost. And so peace was reluctantly established between the two warring nations. But with their cities under the iron boots of the enemy, this humiliating disaster was anything but peaceful. This game was no longer just about the planes. Hammurabi needed to free their people and exact revenge. But with just two cities and a battleship stuck as a lake patrol boat, nothing was looking up. With no centers of science or technology, and with Tamar now enjoying the spoils of two new cities, it was looking like it might might truly be over. But there is one hope. Despite their newfound abilities to propel themselves into the air, Babylon needed allies, and with New Mexico, he found them. Two new civilizations providing an influx of cash to fund his military projects. But even then, Georgia could still wield more funds, and her military just kept getting stronger. Coupled with her fortifications and her two new border cities and superior land forces, even Babylon's naval dominance would prove insufficient. But with a disadvantage on land and an advantage on sea, there was still one more plane they could look to to break the stalemate. And with that, Hammurabi's lifelong goal was complete. Despite a setbacks, two biplane squadrons were built, but it didn't seem like a victory. He needed to take back his lost cities. But with oil reserves running low, they needed to act fast. And so a reconquest campaign was declared. Immediately, the prize was the city in the east with its vast coal and oil reserves, which were needed as the battleship was running on fuel. Fumes. But with the advantage in the skies, Georgia couldn't hope to advance or plan any military action, and eventually was forced
forced to leave the meat grinder that was the Petra city. And in Babylon's forces moved, securing the city and isolating her forward army, which attempted a last ditch counterattack. But while they were powerful, this was no longer the Babylon of before, where a single cavalry charge would shatter the ranks. And after enough napalm was dropped to make the remaining forces look like Harvey Dent, they were left with no choice but to surrender. After such a disaster and the reconquest of resource-rich areas, Tamar saw the writing on the wall and sued for peace. However, Hammurabi's response, an announcement of military cooperation with Latoro, who would send advisors. With supply lines now open, new equipment and intel provided, the Babylonians completed their Reconquista, and top honors were given to the battleship that saved the Empire. Codename Silly Babylonians. After achieving all their goals despite their greed almost proving their downfall numerous times, now was the time to make peace. But despite this game surely being a loss, planes were still built and lost cities were taken back. Although this game would have proven much easier had their starting warrior been as strong as a giant death robot like in this video.